With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. Ah, welcome back to Heard Tell, I'm Andrew Donaldson. Thank you for joining us for our little attempt to try to turn down the noise of the news cycle, talk about things that mattered, skip the things that don't, get good information to discern our times, because really that's the best thing we can do when we're dealing with culture and politics. I want to talk about something that really, really matters, both in the near term and long term, doesn't get talked about a whole lot other than every now and then you'll see a news story about it. Uh, the teacher shortage. Now, it's a nationwide problem, but of course, it's different in different places. My home state of West Virginia, it is at a critical level. It's an absolute disaster right now with the teacher shortage. Other places are doing a little bit better, but there's no denying that there's a teacher shortage. But why? Let's back up a little bit because there's a lot of talk about this issue but there's also a lot of reasons for it. It's complicated. It's not just teacher pay. If teacher pay was the only incident, we could fix it by just dumping money. And as we already know, and we cover extensively, we spend more money on education than any country in the world. And we're not getting a lot of return for it. So it's not just the teacher pay, although that's part of it. We'll get into that in just a second. Let's back up, though. One of our core principles here is things don't happen in a vacuum. They happen in a sequence. So let's start with the near-term past with COVID that exposed a lot of things about the education system and a lot of lessons that, frankly, we are not learning properly. We need to go back and reflect. One thing it showed, we put tremendous pressure on our teachers. Now, I'm talking about our in-classroom teachers. One of the problems here also is a lot of that money, a lot of that funding has been going to other things in the school system that never darkens the door of a classroom. The administrative level of education has exploded and with its salaries and job opportunities. There's another part of this, too, that teachers are having a hard time is, yes, they're not the highest paid profession in the world, but they are increasingly demanded to have more and more education and education and certification is expensive and that outstrips the wages they earn. That's a problem. Also, during COVID, remember, you had at least two whole college age groups. And I know this from personal experience from somebody that I love and care for deeply was in the middle of their student teaching to become teachers at the college level when COVID hit and shut it all down. It turned them off so bad that they don't want nothing to do with it. I wonder how many other people had that same problem. Also, let's go back in history a little bit. This is not the first teacher shortage our country has ever faced. In fact, both my parents were career educators. They're now both retired, but they became educators and they both got to go to college out of relative poverty, they both got to go to college on federal grants to become teachers with the understanding that they would stay in West Virginia and be teachers afterwards. And they did for over 35 years. My mother as a special education teacher, my father as a uh, social studies teacher, he also coached, also became a principal later on. Now, that's how they went to school. But that whole generation that did that has all mostly retired now. They're all in their mid to late 70s. So that's part of the teacher shortage problem now is you had that entire baby boom generation from the late 60s, early 70s that went into the school system. They've all retired now. It left a gap. You see that in a lot of other industries as well, not just teachers, but that's part of the problem. So with that backstory, let's bring it back up to today and the teacher shortage and what to do about it. This is not going to be a buzzword answer or a political answer. There are cultural and in economic concerns that will be individualized to certain states and even certain school districts. Rural districts have different challenges than inner city districts. Suburban districts have some advantages that city districts and rural districts may not have, such as having growth. And these districts and states start getting into competition for their teachers. That's not super healthy, but it is what it is. So what do we do about it? This is going to be an all of the above uh, kind of a fix. Yes, you're going to have to deal with teacher pay, especially in certain areas, and teachers should probably get paid a little bit more than they were in some places. But that's not the whole story, and that's not the whole fix. The educational part of this and the certification portion of this needs to be dealt with. With education getting more and more expensive, if you're demanding teachers have more and more education, that means they're spending more money going more into debt, possibly with student loans, before they ever get into a classroom to start earning for it. That's not good. Also, there's something to be said for people that are already experienced in life, that already have 
bachelor's and master's degrees or even higher, but they're not allowed to go into a classroom and teach in the fields that they are experts in without a, quite frankly, Byzantine process in a lot of places. We should streamline that, get more people that know what they're doing in the fields that they study, things like science and math that are hard teaching places to fill and get folks in there. There's also vocational things that you could do to get certain teachers in there. I know the military's had a troops to teachers program for years and years, people that can come in and if nothing else, at least be substitutes in the short term. And if they have their degrees and other qualifications, perhaps can have a second career. People that retire from things like the military and other things in their early 40s could still have long careers in education. Why are we talking about this, though? Because this is important stuff. If we're not properly educating our children, a lot of this culture and politics stuff we debate isn't going to hash out really well in the long term with the next generation. Let's go back to COVID for a second. What COVID taught us is how we really think about these schools. We think of them as job programs first and foremost, daycare centers second, and occasionally places to do education. That's what our actions tell us. That's what our funding tells us. That's what our politics tells us. That's what we really think of education. Education is not some magical unicorn that you just put the word education and people learn. It's something that's got to be done. My parents were both teachers. I saw it firsthand. Teachers, the good teachers, work really hard. It's a grinding, challenging job under the best of circumstances. But we want to act politically like we can just throw money at it and put people in certain slots and education in the classroom will magically happen. That's not the case. We need to stop treating our education system as a giant jobs program for a lot of people. And education is big business in America. Let's not kid ourselves here. And we need to quit treating the public education system, especially as a giant daycare center. And we need to all collectively sit down and decide what education in America means. And then we will be able to start fixing things like the teacher shortage. Because right now, a lot of the teachers just feel caught in the middle between a public that can't be happy, parents that aren't happy, an administrative state that's getting more money, more funding, more paid than they are without doing the actual in-classroom work they are, they feel squeezed on all sides. And COVID was the last straw for a lot of them. And they're throwing up their hands. Yes, parents are being overly critical sometimes. Yes, students are really hard to deal with. But we need to get our teachers in the proper perspective. We need to give them the proper support. And then we need to start actually fixing this problem as it exists in the United States of America in the year 2022. Because in the years to come, if we continue to have teacher shortages and don't have quality people teaching our children, a lot of this other stuff ain't going to matter. It's going to be a shambles no matter what we do. More we'll tell right after this. Ah, welcome back to Herd Tell. I'm excited to talk about this topic because this is one of those topics I hear people talk about it all the time, and I don't think we talk about it correctly. So let's go to Jeff Broadus, a uh, new face to the program, but going to very much talk to him. Broadus Defense, a lot of other stuff, deep background on this stuff. Sir, how are you today? Really appreciate your time. I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Let's start right there because... I want you to give folks a little bit of background on what you do with Broadest Defense, but this is one of those things where, yeah, the military and law enforcement, they have the expertise on this thing, but more and more, there's a knowledge gap to the average American where they need to have some of this knowledge, even if they don't have that background. Give us your background and then how that inspires you to talk to the average American person about these kind of issues. Right. Okay. Uh, well... I'll say this, my, you know, just as a matter of context to let you know where I'm coming from, I started my uh, career in the U.S. Marine Corps uh, in the late 90s, uh, a pre-9-11 uh, guy, and spent seven and a half years in the infantry uh, with uh, 1st Battalion, 5th Marines. I deployed to the Western Pacific, Okinawa, Australia, you know, the regular peacetime type readiness deployment, but then ended up going to Operation Iraqi Freedom. Uh, when it first kicked off in uh, 2003 with them, and then spent some more time in the training realm. Uh, when I left active duty in 2006, I became a U.S. Secret Service agent. I was a special agent and a firearms instructor with Secret Service, and that's where I kind of 
caught the training bug, figuring out how people think and and applying the hard skills that that I learned on the battlefield with the protective neck methodologies of the Secret Service. And I was traveling, I remained in the reserves, I'm a Marine reservist, and I was traveling to the Colorado State Rifle Championships to shoot competitively for the Marines uh, a few years later. And I decided to visit the Columbine Memorial. Um, and I was walking the grounds over there. It's a it's a tragic place. And and uh, I saw a flagstone, like an inscription on the, on the uh, memorial that said, we were never teachers, or we were never trained for this. We were just teachers doing what we do every day. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. That was a real watershed moment for my career because I realized that, as I mentioned, I knew what to do. You know, I knew uh, crisis management. I knew how to think under stress. I'd been in life and death situations that I that I knew that I could navigate that and, and help people that do not ro- respond to problems for a living to to think better, to pre-deliberate, to eliminate denial, to to act when it's time to act, to protect themselves and enhance their survival. And that that's how this started. Uh, I had a special relationship with the Advanced Law Enforcement Rapid Response Training Center or the Alert Center out of San Marcos, Texas. It's an institute that is part of the Texas State University system. We were already training cops and firemen and EMTs how to respond to stuff like an active shooter event, but I realized that there was a gap for regular folks. And that's where we uh, figured out that we could really enhance the survival and, and positively affect the outcome of a critical incident like an active shooter yeah the the thing with the schools is that's the one i think everybody universally relates to because they've all gone through school a lot of folks have kids that's the one where it really hits home for everybody all at once look i remember taking my kids to school the morning after parkland and we had you know our we had really great sros that's the uh, sheriff's department where i live heavy presence that morning i mean they were all over the place very visible for good reason Mm -hmm. that sort of stuff that's the one that I think hits people at home. You just mentioned it inspired you as well. What do you do when you have a moment like a Parkland, like a Uvalde, something like that? But we know how the news cycle works, right? It, it right. Even as bad as it is, it has a shelf life. It revolves yeah. back down. How do you take that moment and take it into concrete action? Because that seems to be where the fallout is. Like, yeah, we can do things like single points of entry and electronic locked doors and things like that. But when you start talking about vigilance, awareness, preparedness, how do you gap that from the urgency of the moment of let's all do something to, oh, let's go back to business as usual because schools are a bureaucracy. Let's be honest about it. How do we gap that? Right. That's a good question. Um, Well, the short answer is post-incident, I don't do anything differently. Uh, In fact, my network of professionals that are involved in response training and things like that we debrief this stuff in person at our annual conference every year um and i hear firsthand from the people that were actually first through the door how things actually went down so i don't watch too much news um every now and again media will reach out to me to for some commentary i try to lend some sanity to it but unlike your program that i'm a little familiar with the the noise as you mentioned the noise the 24-hour news cycle get Let's immediately start talking about gun control. We'll have two halves of the screen yelling at each other. And then 24 to 48 hours later, it's it's business as usual. I don't we're not training people to do anything different post incident. We're just doing a lot more of it because people are interested. Your point about schools, um, you know, we care about the educational environment because everybody in the in the workforce has either kids, grandkids, nieces, nephews in school. Um, and I, I'm no exception. I have three little ones that are school age. Uh, and, and this stuff terrifies me too. The difference is that I've got the tools to give them and to give, you know, teachers and faculty and other students that they can make a difference. I've seen some very, uh, fancy, important politicians get on TV and say, you know, tragically, there's just nothing we can do about this. And that could not be further from the truth. I think that's irresponsible to say that. Um, what, uh, the, the schools, statistically speaking, in the last 22 years of data that we've collected on on the active shooter problem, uh, schools statistically, these events only happen in schools about a quarter of the time that they happen. Most people are surprised to hear that, about 25% of the time. We care about it because the nature and the density of the victims, uh, the ages, you know, I do this for a living and after Sandy Hook, I wept. Um, it, it got me, you know. And I, I think that um, if... What I would tell people is the, the buzzers, the cameras, the single points of entry, all of those things are effective 
uh, in their own right. Um, we do security consulting for brick and mortar schools and facilities, and we advocate for all those things. But they're all concentric layers of security that work together to solve a problem. No one thing by itself, and certainly no inanimate object is going to stop this. Um, vigilance, human software, what's between the ears as far as your situational awareness, all of those things are the most important component to being ready and reacting to something like this. Um, our training focus he focuses heavily on human factors of violence, uh, what being scared does to your decision making ability, and how we can head that off and understand how our brains are wired so that we can perform better. The other thing I'll say is that um, it is it is usually not the new wall, the bulletproof backpack, the camera, the lock, all of those things, like I said, work together, but they're not the solution. I heard a very smart person at a school safety conference recently, uh, and I forgot who it was, but this was a really great observation that in all of the incidents that that happened at their school and they ended up having a school shooting, what got left out was the child. They had the safest building in the world. Everything was right. But the the middle schooler that perpetrated that particular shooting, you went back in their history of mental health care, of counseling, of, of people noticing aberrant behavior and talking to each other on the crisis management team. They got everything right, except they left out the child. And that is a critical point as well. Another meaningful stat that I tell my students is eight out of 10 of these events, eight out of 10, think about that as a meaningful statistic, eight out of 10 times in the rearview mirror, this person communicated, elicited a threat against the, the institution they were going to victimize. Uh, that really, talking about situational awareness, it's not just a, a physical safety thing. It's also, hey, you know, Johnny hasn't been himself or he's drawing things that are, are bothering me. I'm not going to use my my self-denial to explain that away or say it's probably nothing. I'm going to engage the proper resources to get that person help. And most of the time, the perpetrators, when we look back in the review, something could have been done or said. Yeah, Jeff Broad is joining us. Look, look this is just grown folk talk about this topic is human beings have bandwidth and they have human nature to deal with. It's an eternal problem, whether it's the military as far back as recorded human history goes. How much time do you put into vigilance and preparation compared to everything else you have to do? And you just spoke about it. it's like, well, they get everything right except the kid. Well, because it's easier to change the building than it is to deal with people. These these are universal human problems. But when you start putting violence as the end result of these problems, that's where this gets really complicated. That's really the core problem here. When we, It's not just the active shooters. It's not just workplace violence and all these other things we've seen. These are human problems that we're trying to solve. And like you just said, software between your ears, there has to be a human answer to it beyond just the policy and the buildings and all that part. That's really the nut of all this, isn't it? Right. Yeah, it, it, it truly is. And, you know, I often get asked, I've got an enormous breadth of people that I work with, everything from, you know, faith-based institutions to kindergarten teachers. They're never going to have, you know, somebody with guns standing around, probably nor should they, uh, right next to them all the time. We teach them how to lock down their classrooms or how to evacuate all the way up to we train um, law enforcement snipers. In, the, in training and even so i've hosted training for some special units in the military the common thread that runs between all of them is that they have blood pumping through their veins they've got a heart in their chest a brain in their in their skull and these are people they're human beings even if they're wrapped in a uniform and velcro and gear or if they're just a, a school teacher um, they are all subject to the human factors of violence uh, and the stress response, the sympathetic nervous system that engages in our body when we're scared. Um, and so the key to the proper mindset, really, if you want to think about it chronologically, to your point is mental preparation, right? Vigilance. Uh, remember from the military days when you're leaving the, the Ford operating base, there's signs facing inboard that say complacency kills. So when you're out there on that patrol, you have to be keep your head on a swivel, what I call condition yellow, right? Relaxed but aware that problems could be a problem. People should be like that in their workplace every day. And um, that takes a certain discipline because, you know, people are fickle. They forget, oh, you know, you're scared the next day after a Sandy Hook happens or a Parkland happens, but what about a, a year later? Um, so, yeah, you have to keep your head on a swivel in the, in the preparation. The other thing is training. 
the reason that people in the military and firefighters and special ops guys and all the reason that they perform well they weren't born special they prepared so by training regular folks within their context i don't expect a a um a preacher to conduct his church you know head and eyes up doing five point scanning sequence on every every one of his parishioners that's not his job but noticing your baselines in life and being able to identify anomalies in that baseline hey what's wrong is wrong okay i'm ready i'm ready to make a decision that something's wrong um is gold and when we do training what we're trying to do we have three goals basically we're trying to teach regular people to do is eliminate denial from your process you got to do that ahead of time okay if i hear something loud in my office space on a tuesday morning it's not firecrackers okay let's get rid of that right now um the next thing is you need to pre-deliberate so we're both sitting i'm sitting in my home right now uh, you're sitting it looks like in your home or your office you've got um you're in a habitual workspace every day so you have the ability to uh, pre-deliberate ahead of time what will i do um decide ahead of time hey how am i going to get out of here what's my primary secondary tertiary exits if i had to if i had to lock down my space you know if i had to barricade in here because i couldn't get away what could I use to do that? And then lastly, hey, is there a weapon of opportunity I could use to defend myself if necessary as a last resort? You think about all that stuff ahead of time so that we know that it, under stress, we make bad decisions because we, we get dumb when we're trying to fight, flight, or freeze. So what we do is if we pre-deliberate ahead of time, we don't have to say, oh, you know, what am I going to do? We just execute the plan, right? Yeah. And then the third thing we tell people to do is when it's time to act, do it, do it, do it aggressively. Um, we, my football coach used to say, if you're going to screw up, screw up 110%, right? So that's, that's what you do is you, when it's time to act, you do so aggressively. Yeah. Jeff Broad is joining us. You just mentioned it. So let's use the example. Like, look, the, the church that I attend, um, we have armed <laughs> plainclothes security, uh, volunteer folks, because we're a heavy military community. We have that ability because we have a wide pool to pull from. I know that I know the folks that are there. So because, look, I got my own issues. Like you just said, if, you know, I sit in a crowd, sometimes I start looking at sight lines and exits and I'm not paying attention when I'm supposed to be paying attention to God. Right. Right. <laughs> That's just me. When you work with a house of worship or a big business that has a big common area like banks, things like this that you deal with that could be targets soft. When you go in to talk to these folks that don't have that background and you start putting it in, what is the first things you start trying to tell them, you know, cause you want them to have kind of a sense of urgency, but you don't want to have perpetual panic either. Maybe ratio ain't the right word, but there's some kind of a balance when you start inter introducing this kind of stuff to the general population how do you go about it and what do your clients and when you're talking to them what's that look like yeah what well it's important I mean, when you're dealing with different kinds of people you've got to build a rapport with folks first you got to let them know that hey yeah i was a, a scary infantry marine i was a secret agent you know whatever all these fancy things when they hear your resume they walk in and they're visibly some of them are very visibly tense because they don't know if I'm going to go drill instructor on them or if I'm going to, you know, talk about, you know, uh, killing and violence. It's intimidating and nobody likes to talk about this stuff. So usually we, we break the ice a little bit and I say, look, I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a, I'm a believer. Uh, the, these, are, these are the things that I do and why I do them. I tell them the story about Columbine Memorial and say, look, this hit me in the gut and, and I'm here to make you safer. I'm here to help you, uh, to arm you. So, you know, uh, practically speaking, with some tools that you can use mentally to get ready for, uh, for something that, by the way, is a very low probability, high severity incident. It's probably never going to happen to you. But if it does, you'll be able to, you can relax, right? From this day forward, you can relax because you know what to do. And, uh, and there's no sense, uh, I don't want people walking around worrying about this stuff all the time. The whole point is to give people some options based program to allow them to have a you know to know what to do so that they won't fret about it on the front side everybody subconsciously even if they're not a person who is a good situational awareness will worry about this and the universal feedback i get when we're done training with regular folks is wow i i used to worry about this a lot i feel a lot better they they don't walk out feeling scared they walk out feeling a little more prepared 
Jeff Broad is joining us. You're talking about that that mental aspect of it. And of course, you know, when you're in the military, everything's mental. You know, it's yeah. mental first because, you know, you know, fast isn't fast, smooth is fast, calm is fast, that sort of stuff. I got to ask you, though, because, you know, kind of on a little bit of a lighter note, but it goes to that point. Do you really have a correlation between a kindergarten teacher and a sniper? Because that sounds so counterintuitive and backwards. I I guess we probably do have some kindergarten teachers that's got some skill sets from the military somewhere out there. But (laughs) uh, mentally, though, there's a connection there, really? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as I mentioned before, the, the the largest connection is that they're both human beings. Um, they're subject to the same uh, sympathetic nervous system that engages during fear. Um, obviously, the job descriptions are different and that, that sniper trains for different scenarios uh, to make a high value shot in a compressed amount of time with maybe a non-standard shooting position. And his skill sets are very different. Uh, my wife's an educator. She teaches second grade. Um, has since I've known her, and I and I would challenge you with the notion that if I were to put that sniper in a room full of um, 25 uh, second graders or kindergartners, they wouldn't be able to handle it the first day. Okay, so it's a different kind of stress. Um, and so yeah, so call. So I would say the connection between them is that they're both humans. The other connection between them is those people. Neither one of those people do that job for the money. These are purpose-driven people that do it because of their faith or their desire to develop little minds or their desire to protect the innocent um, on the law enforcement side. Uh, These are people that are purpose-driven and they care about their jobs and calmness of mind and preparation makes them better at their jobs. And so you you joke about the the kindergarten teacher. I got to tell you, I have some clients here in Texas. We do have armed school guardian program and we engage in that training if that is the correct option for the client. And one of the things I've noticed is these are self-selectors. These are people that stuck their hand up and say, hey, I, I want to learn a skill set to make myself a better protector. They're already coming to me. We're talking primary school teachers, uh, young, usually women under the age of 40 uh, that are that are saying, hey, um, teach me so I can protect these kids better. And when we challenge them with stressful scenarios with or without a gun in their hand, we see the claws come out. We challenge them and say, think about why you are here. And the mama bear instinct in a classroom teacher uh, who doesn't have maybe the hard skills yet before they come to us, uh, that instinct in them, that, that drive to be a protector, to protect the innocent is much, much stronger than most people know. And yeah. Rolling around with a weapon is not for everyone, and I, we don't advocate for that. But if you make the choice to do that, you're either an asset or you're a liability. So, so we want what we do is we find the the why in that person, and we engage it because it's going to be a superpower for them to succeed. Yeah, Jeff Broad is joining us. Look, we've we've all seen it now. We saw workplace <laughs> violence recently with the Walmart shooting. We've had you know more mass shootings. If somebody finds themselves in this situation, I, I find the media news media narratives on this and some, frankly, some of the training that people talk about, look, you know, run, hide, fight. I know it's a nice little slogan, but it seems insufficient to me. And of course, you know, I've had other training, so it kind of butts up against some of that. Give folks something a little better than that. And I know you can't, you know, combat train every single person in America, nor should we, frankly, because that could be detrimental. Give some folks some practical stuff, those like, because everybody has fight or flight in them. What's right. just one or two things when that fight or flight hits them that makes them make the good decision between those two things? Because your body's going to do one or the other, whether you want it to or not. It's right. just how do you steer it that two, three, four degrees to make a good decision? Give folks right. something to do with that. Well, the staff response model, we call it, <clears throat> that we advocate for is similar to run, hide, fight, but but it's a different uh, different directives. We use the terms avoid, deny, defend. A couple reasons for that. Uh, I can't tell a person who uh, is confined to a wheelchair to run. I've shut them down immediately, all right? And they're just as at, at risk or even more so than, they, than somebody else in a situation like that. So we say avoid the attacker. If you can leave, leave. Um, and by the way, you can do this long before things go kinetic. If something ain't right, leave. You're hard to hurt if you're not there. Um, and then the the other the second step would be uh, deny access to your location. 
Uh, not the kind of denial where we think nothing's wrong, but the kind of denial that says, hey, I'm going to deny access by making an obstacle, by locking down, barricading my, stru my structure, my, my room. And then the last one, instead of telling people to fight, we tell them, hey, our HR department's legal people, they like the term defend because everyone does have a legal and moral authority to defend themselves with violence if necessary. So semantics, avoid, deny, defend, or run, hide, fight. The most important thing, Andrew, is uh, mental preparation deciding what you're going to do ahead of time because you're right you don't know what you're going to do i find myself uh i'm not immune to this you know and having a near miss in traffic or something like that i feel that jump in my bloodstream and I, oh you know you lose your breath for a minute and you get scared for a minute i'm a human being you know uh and i train people to deal with this stuff but it still happens to me i would say mental preparation uh i put the seat belt on i do the scanning i have a safe following distance i you know, 10 and 2 i'm watching my rearview mirrors all the time all of those, that that uh, analogy can be applied to your everyday life. So you can't, when you're setting up, uh, I'll, I'll give you better than run, hide, fight. So they're saying hide, okay. Or in our system, we say deny access. What have I done to deny access? You know, if I'm a school safety professional, have I made sure that all of the occupied spaces in my building can be locked from, from the inside of the room without the benefit of using a fine motor skill like a key? or a little twisty button? Um, am I conducting class during the class day between the bells with the door already shut and locked so I don't have to lock down? Uh, these are all best practices now, but it's gotta be done ahead of time. I can't go around and, re and replace the doors, frames, and hardware or whatever in my school during an incident. It's gotta happen months and years ahead of time. So preparation's the biggest key, I think, that I would tell people beyond just the, hey, here's what you do. Because you're right, run, hide, fight, and you don't know what you're gonna do uh action is always faster than reaction and unfortunately in this particular threat uh you're always going to be reacting to some degree so you're already behind the curve when something happens so preparation is that much more important Yeah, Jeff Broad is joining us. You talked about one of the turning points for you was thinking about Columbine and what happened there. I can't think of a news story that hit me harder than the Uvalde thing. It, it enraged me on a lot of levels. And now we are, you know, a couple months down the road and exactly what a lot of us that kind of cover this and keep up with these kind of topics, exactly what happened, happened. It has kind of slipped from the consciousness it does not seem like we've had very much accountability, if any at all. It doesn't seem like we've had a lot of reflecting on it. You're an expert on this. You do this all the time. When you review the whole of the Uvalde incident from the active shooter situation, which was a little unique from a normal active shooter situation, to the standoff, to the response, to what happened afterwards, which just enrages me. When you take the totality of it, what are you taking from that going forward? Because people sure seem to stop talking about it. And I don't think we should, because I think there's a lot of stuff in there that we needed to hash out just as people, let alone as people concerned about things like security and policy issues. Right. Yeah. So that's a, a great question. And of course, being in this uh, in this space professionally, uh, Uvalde was very, very upsetting for those of us that are out there beating the drum every day, trying to get responders to behave appropriately. Look, the bottom line is there are operational goals when you respond to an active shooter. As someone who stuck your hand up, took an oath, you wear a patch on your arm, you carry a gun around, you wear body armor, you carry a radio, you have friends that have body armor and radios and guns. Uh, this is your job to respond. There are operational goals for police, and they are in this order. Stop the killing of innocents. Uh, by stopping that killer, uh, stop the dying by doing point of wounding care on people that need it right then before the EMS arrives or before it's safe to go. And then the last one is rapid casualty evacuation. Uh, those operational goals should be understood by people that are first on scene and by people that assume command. And it frankly is beyond me. I have no good explanation. I wasn't there. I'm not a big fan of Monday morning quarterback over 
combat scenarios or stress events because I wasn't there, but we do have some pretty incredible video and audio of everything that happened. And this is one of those few incidents, Uvalde, is that, that it's pretty much what it looks like. It looks like a failure of leadership. It's a failure of operational goals. Um, it's a failure of command structure. And it's beyond me how that many uh, law enforcement professionals could be in one place and had not anybody for the first several minutes look up and say, hey, I'm going. Who's with me? Because those are the people I work with. Those are the people that I know have already decided what to do. We've all made a commitment to one another that if we're ever placed in that situation, that's what we do. Um, now, I will say this. I don't lump everybody on that scene into one bucket because we know in law enforcement, you're fairly independent when you show up at something. There is no command and control like a military unit where you show up with five of your friends and you're all working together and you have your own job and your boss is right there with you. When you show up in law enforcement, you get out of that cruiser, put your feet on the deck, probably before the thing stops moving and you start gathering information and you, and you respond to the information that you have. We know that subsequent follow on units were told in no uncertain terms they had a barricaded subject. Um, I don't know how they process that information if they heard continued gunshots, which they did. But I do know that um, the, the the failures really were with our first guys in there, our first incident commanders, the school district police chief, abject failure, uh, no doubt about it. Pro if not negligent, maybe even criminally negligent, uh, we should know better. And the and the kind of training that we provide and that the alert center provides is the answer to those problems. We haven't changed a page of the manual since Uvalde. We're just teaching a lot more of it because people took notice. And I hope that continues. I'll say something else about the response because I'm, en I'm enraged by that as well. Politicians will frequently, uh, obviously uh, it was famously said, you never let a crisis go to waste. So the gun control people come out of the woodwork within minutes. Um, uh, and then the other thing that you get is politicians will respond to something in the way that they know how. They want to tell people they care about something. Well, Mr. Politician, how much do you care about this issue, whether it's a, a school district uh, board member or whether it's the governor or a member of the legislature? They'll say, um, well, I care about it. Fifty million dollars. That's how much I care about it. And they'll prop up a big number and they'll throw it out there. And by the time the legislation or the executive order or whatever it's written, and by the way, usually written by a you know 25 year old member of their staff, not a subject matter expert. It gets distilled, watered down, and maybe with the best of intentions, something gets through and funded. The wrong thing gets funded. Um, I have a lot of respect for, for Governor Abbott. I do on many things. But but one of the first things they did by executive order is, is authorize $50 million for ballistic shields. Uh, there's several ballistic shields in that horrible fisheye camera video of that of all of those cops behaving inappropriately and delaying their response. Ballistic shields doesn't solve this problem. And by the way, if you want to dig down into the tactics of it, I know it's a little outside this conversation. A ballistic shield operator class is like a two-day class at a minimum. And on SWAT teams that use ballistic shields, they have a designated guy with special equipment, a different kind of weapon. Uh, and that shield is not for every scenario, certainly not for every active shooter scenario. Um, they're highly used on fugitive warrant squads uh, during barricaded persons or downed officer rescue. But moving at a high rate of speed direct a threat and active shooter that ballistic shield is not the appropriate tool most of the time and so i would say that while the governor and and his staff and and probably several people that wanted to do the right thing uh authorized a bunch of equipment equipment wasn't the problem in uvalde they had all kinds of cool equipment there uh it was operational command and decision making and if they would have applied 50 million dollars to training every peace officer in this state in the concepts and principles of incident command and operational goals responding to an active shooter, that would have been a better application of those funds. Yeah. I had an old chief told me way back when I was a young and very, very, not very good enlisted person was like the bigger, the mess, the bigger, the leadership failure without exception. He's that's like, true. that's always the ratio. Thank you.
Yeah. Jeff brought us one last real, real quick thing. I just want to ask you though, how do we change our conversation about this? Cause we can't do a whole lot about the news media and we can't do a lot about the politicians like you just talked to, but almost all of us have social media of some kind when there is an incident, when there's uh, whether it's a mass shooting or just a violent thing or, or a gun control debate or anything like this, what's something we can do to elevate the conversations ourselves, just the way we're talking to each other, either in person or on social media that pushes the ball forward, at least the discussion part of it, even if it doesn't lead to a policy thing. Cause I think we kind of miss the baby steps on stuff like this. We want a broad swath like that $50 million instead of just saying, Hey, maybe we can get a little more specific with our nomenclature. We can say this a little more carefully, or we can reach out to somebody and try to find a little common ground here. Give us something like that that we can do practically. I think we can, this is going to sound a bit Pollyanna, but I, I think that um, we can turn the temperature down on the conflict over the politics stuff, like the gun control or like, you know, public funding or what have you, we can turn that down a bit if we all just have a little more empathy for one another and treat, treat other people with respect. That really is at the root of all of this violence anyway, is somebody feels marginalized or somebody feels like they have to get revenge on someone else. We need to crank the temperature down and treat other people with respect and respect other people's viewpoints. Um, just because somebody has a different path to what we all want, which is a safer learning environment for our kids, for example. Uh, I'm not going to start throwing insults at them and tell them they're trying to destroy my country and stuff like that and then take my guns away or whatever. That's not useful. Um, the other thing I would say, and it's 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 a little unrelated to, to that, but it is related to social media and media, is we have to stop. And this goes all the way down to a person that that retweets or shares something or whatever. We have to stop bandying around the names and images of perpetrators of violence. Um, there's a great campaign that the Alert Center at, in San Marcos uh, pushes forward called Don't Name Them. There's information for media people at a website called don'tnamethem.org. And it basically advocates for, hey, if you're a media outlet or a police chief or a politician and allow the PIO of the police department to put out the name of that suspect and any information they have about them, a single time or provide it to media and writing if they want, but don't stand at the dais and say their name over and over again and give them the notoriety that they sought by hurting people. Because uh, when we when we retweet that image or we share that image, um, we're, we're re-victimizing victims. Um, we're giving that person the notoriety that they sought in the first place. And we're creating copycats. Contagion effect is a real thing. Long ago, media outlets stopped uh, reporting and over-reporting suicides because they psychologists told them, "Hey, this has a this has a contagion effect." Um, we we know through data patterns that we believe that that is also true with active shooter. If if I know because of the 24-hour news cycle now and and because of social media, if I'm an eighth grader that's having a terrible year, and who didn't have a terrible eighth grade year, right? But this kid has a lacks the foundation to sustain. Uh, triggers in their life, uh, stressors in their life. And I know that I can get Shepard Smith to come to my town tomorrow and say my name over and over and over again if I do something horrible. It's a pretty short decision for me. I want to die anyway. You know, I'm going to do that thing. But if we don't engage in putting their images up um, and saying their names, I think it removes some of the incentive. Um, one of the things I do in my training class is I actually say, I engage in this too. I don't, I know everything there is to know about these active shooters. I've read all their, their BS manifestos and, and, you know, cause I have to, it's, it's part of my job to understand these motivations, but we don't say, we don't talk about them much in our uh, presentations cause it's not germane to response. Um, but one of the things I do is I say, close your eyes for a minute see if you can picture the Sandy Hook shooter, see if you can picture them. And most people can by a show of hands because they've seen his mug on a screen so often that it's that it's burned into them, it's traumatized them. And then I have them open their eyes and I flash up a picture of, of Vicki Soto, a, a fifth year first grade teacher who lost her life at Sandy Hook. And she saved many of her students by locking them into cabinets. And this is the kind of person that we ought to be talking about, ought to be celebrating the lives of the protectors and, and not talking about the people that do this, this kind of thing. When we do that, we're part of the problem. Yeah, Jeff brought us. I so appreciate this conversation. I think this is how we do things like that. It, it goes to what you just said about social media, though. When you're dealing, something my dad told me years ago, he's like, people that are scared act differently, you got to treat them differently. 
and people get scared talking about this stuff and we got to be a little more show more grace because they're coming from a place where they're they're worried about it and they're scared about it give them a little more grace give them a little more slack let them maybe let them get that first blast of venting out and then we can kind of get to the problem so appreciate this let folks know where they can keep up with you what you have going on uh not just with your business but also with you so they can follow you until we talk to you again next time on hurt tell yeah, absolutely. Uh, the the best way to learn more about uh, what we do uh, for in the training space or threat and vulnerability assessments of facilities and things like that, and and advising on your procedures and policies in your organization, uh, no matter the type, is go to broadestdefense.com and uh, check out our website. There's links to our socials from there, uh, and um, we'd be glad to. We're very responsive. We'd be glad to reach out to you and talk to you about. You know what your requirements are and if if all we get to do is point you in the right direction for some low to no cost resources we're happy to do that uh or if we can help you further absolutely we can do that as well jeff brought us so appreciate the time today sir appreciate it very much absolutely thank you andrew yes sir Let's end on a good note. We have this bizarre story out of Moore County, North Carolina, of uh, obvious vandalism, perhaps something even more sinister, taking down the power grid out there for those folks. We'll cover that story more when it develops because we're not going to jump on this. We're going to let it breathe. A lot of people running with it and jumping to conclusions. We're not going to do this, but there's been some good in there uh, from WRAL. Uh, the Moore County Sheriff's Office opened up their facilities. Anybody without power, if they need to charge their phones to use the bathroom facilities, they have gym facilities, locker room facilities, they've opened up their ability for that. And also Harris Teeter, the grocery chain, uh, one of my personal favorite places to shop, frankly, uh, they have offered, they will give 10 pounds of ice for free to anybody that needs it. Now, why is that so special? Well, folks that don't go through power outages or winter or hurricanes or things like that, you put ice in your fridge and your freezer, you can actually keep your stuff for a couple of days at least uh, if you properly keep it iced, even if you don't have a generator or something. So this is really important stuff and a good showing of the community coming together when you have something obviously nefarious going on with the power grid. We'll cover the power grid story later, but we wanted to end on a good note, good on the sheriff's office, the police department, and Harris Teeter for taking care of their community in this particular instance. That'll do it for Herd Tell. Thank you so much for joining us. Love to hear from you. We get interesting feedback. We build shows and segments based off your feedback. Herd Tell Show at gmail.com. Herd Tell Show on the Twitter. Make sure you share us. We'd appreciate it. Make sure you're subscribing, iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, if you want to watch us, however you're watching and or listening, we greatly appreciate it. So wherever you are across the street or around the world, we hope you're well. We hope you are well fed. And we will talk to you again real, real soon on Hurt Tell. All the music on Hurt Tell is provided under a creative content license from monstercat.com.